So, so just finishing up that thought, uh, Kunal. So that's one of the trends that we're kind of seeing. So, it would be good to kind of get some comments on that. Sure. So, welcome to the Institute of Product Leadership. Uh, we are kicking off our speaker series for this year and uh, hosting a fireside, fireside chat with Kunal Shah of Free Charge. Um, before we jump into the, uh, the talk itself, I'd like to just briefly introduce the institute. IPL, as it's uh, more commonly known, is a global business school for technology and product innovators. And we offer uh, programs in uh, the EMBA and TMBA programs, as well as workshops and uh, shorter duration programs. Um, IPL works out of four campuses um, in India and the US. Just a housekeeping note before we get started. Access to all IPL webinar content is available on CLAP, our continuous learning and access program. Uh, sign up is free. Uh, you can head over to uh, the IPL website, uh, www.productleadership.com, and sign up. Um, two lucky attendees of the webinar today uh, will get um, inseparable twins. Uh, this book by Professor Naveen Lakur, who's one of our uh, faculty. Uh, talks all about ideation and innovation, very apt for entrepreneurs and uh, free entrepreneurs. So without much ado, uh, let me introduce uh, Kunal Shah, who's going to be the uh, speaker today. Uh, Kunal will be talking to Professor Pinkesh Shah, who's a faculty of uh, IPL, who's dialing in from Silicon Valley today. Um, Professor Pinkesh Shah is ex-VP of uh, McAfee, a global uh, vice president of product management. Kunal himself, um, I think almost everybody on the webinar today knows uh, about Kunal, but let me just give a brief intro before I hand it over to him. Building a consumer internet company in this decade is very hard. Scaling it to tens of millions of users is harder. Determining the right time to sell it profitably, but remaining firmly in the driver's seat, post-sale is perhaps the hardest. Today, the Institute is proud to bring to our community a chat with a product leader who has done all three, Kunal Shah. Kunal is the free founder of Recharge, one of the most innovative UH companies that Indian consumers have ever seen. And an entrepreneur since the age of 16, his experiment with Paisa back in 2009 led to the launch of Recharge in 2010. Recharge has grown to over 40 million users and accepted by over a lack of merchants across the country. Kunal still remains at the helm of free charge uh, after the sale to Snapdeal last year, and he drives growth and aligning uh, of the business model with Snapdeal's uh, strategies. Over to Kunal. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, this is my first time attending a webinar. It's kind of a awkward setup for me. Uh, uh, talking to people without seeing them, but uh, I'll still go ahead and uh, talk about a few views. Uh, uh, case, what I would suggest is that once we talk for kind of do a talk for like 10 or minutes, we should probably just move on to the Q and A format. That could be more interesting as a format. Uh, just to kind of give a perspective over here. Uh, uh, a, a lot of times, uh, 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 what what happens is I've seen. Uh, Consumer internet startups are are, are are thought to be hard because uh, most people, uh, while they do formal education uh, in different technical fields, uh, very little attention is paid to study of human behavior, uh, and and human behavior is not uh, an alien science. It, it is kind of fairly uh, well documented and and. It is important for every leader to actually study it, not just a B2C entrepreneur, because uh, guess what? Every employee that you're going to hire is going to be a human. Every boss that you're going to work with for is human. Every person you're going to marry is human. Every investor you're going to get is human, and you're going to probably raise humans as kids. Uh, without the study of human behavior, I cannot imagine one to be a great leader. A lot of people are, of, are natural. Uh, 
and and uh, can understand the principles well and therefore do better but uh, we are all not designed to do that naturally and therefore I, I see that study of human behavior is an interesting uh, but important aspect for being successful in general. Uh, for me um, that happened primarily because I, I dropped out of I was pursue I was going to pursue my engineering slash medical like any other guy at 12th grade but I decided to pursue my graduation in philosophy even though I was a science student uh, for 11th and 12th grade and and then I dropped out of uh, MBA in um, uh, 2003-2004 when I decided to do a part-time MBA from NMIMS. Uh, again, uh, it was uh, a, another decision where uh, primarily for me just doing the technical theoretical knowledge was not enough. So I dropped out and decided to focus on the study of human behavior and psychology on my own uh, and probably read like, I don't know, 100-150 books on that uh, and, and got a good grasp of it. Uh, it got triggered from my MBA days, but it kind of something got better uh, through experiments that I've done in my own life. Uh, I have noticed that uh, a lot of times we we kind of uh, struggle with the basic thing because we don't understand how to operate humans, right? It's just less like a operating system by itself, right? And and uh, uh, if you don't know how what commands work and what kind of things make it slow, what kind of things make it fast, what kind of thing. Uh, results in errors, <laughs> we, we are less likely to kind of be able to use the operating system to our advantage. Uh, I, I think a B2C entrepreneur in this country is a function of empathizing and understanding consumers and their insights. And insights don't come to people who are not actively observing and, and active observation is something that I don't see many people do uh, because it's not something that is they have been uh, trained to do or or have natural interest in. For me, it's something that I I picked up very early in life, and um, I would always look for an interesting insight. Uh, being an introverted kind of a person, I would let's say I go to a mall, but kind of observe things like I would count number of people who came out of a mall and see how many people actually had a shopping bag in their hand, right? Just kind of estimating. Uh, footfall multiplication to conversion rate and kind of ab apply average ticket size to kind of guesstimate the mall's daily revenues, right? And I'm just kind of giving an example of how, what kind of mental exercises I would do uh, and, and thereby again in, insights around, like for example, I observed that only in India on a Sunday, like less than 3.7% or, or sometimes even uh, a lesser number of people would have a shopping bag when they come out of a mall, right? And and it kind of counterintuitive. If you tell this to an, an American retailer that here we have a mall where only 4% of people walk out of their shopping bag, it will just not make sense. Uh, but if you stay in India, you'll probably be able to understand and relate to this. Uh, but we don't do these active observations and therefore uh, don't come up with good, great insights to kind of build, to solve on. Another challenge I have seen with entrepreneurs and especially with the engineering background, they keep repeating the word that the problem I'm trying to solve. Uh, I believe that uh, problem is a very limited word. Uh, you should be looking at efficiency that I'm, inefficiency that I'm going after uh, is a much larger topic to go after and, and something may not be a problem. When I started to recharge, recharging was not a problem. Um, but uh, it was something uh, that uh, uh, was inefficient and as long as you may not make consumers experience in an efficient method, they will not necessarily feel a problem in their existing behavior, right? So it's basically till you make them taste the cake, they are not going to necessarily have any problem with the bread, right? So so you have to keep pushing them in that direction uh, and, and, and that's what humanity is moving into, constantly becoming more and more efficient. Uh, other things that I think uh, I have seen a lot of B2B, I come from a B2B business background, I used to run an outsourcing company uh, uh, and, and B2C is not like a big challenge as long as you understand humans and, and, and a lot of people just kind of find that to be a, a big challenge but I believe it's a fundamental behavior or learning that you need to have to be able to do good in B2B as well because guess what, uh, even in B2B you are selling to humans. Um, 
and and maybe maybe a one last thought in in talking about India is a interesting thing. Uh, you know the the funny thing is that I was look thinking about is that you know we, we were told in our school days that you know British divided and ruled India, but when I look at the facts, what I'm finding is that we were actually divided before British came in because of the princely states and all these different cultures and languages and other things we had. Uh, and actually, we were joined by British for their administrative convenience. Uh, but again, we are getting into a, a, a divided mode thanks to the politics that are happening right now um, in the region. And and um, that makes me wonder why you know people find it very hard to trust each other. We are we are forced into becoming one country, and therefore we speak different languages, we 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 eat different kind of food, we have different cultural uh, rituals and religions, and so on and so forth. But the interesting thing is that uh, in a trust deficit nation, uh, it is it is hard uh, uh, to build efficiency based products because uh, uh, people just don't necessarily naturally trust each other. For example, in a U.S., if you go there, if you order some food and you get a bill at a restaurant, nobody checks the bill before paying. It's just assumed and and trusted. In India, people would check the bill before they pay, or if they give their car for servicing, they would empty the fuel tank, or or they would ask for a demand draft versus a check. This is not a common behavior that you will see in nations that trust each other a lot. And therefore, in India, every product is actually first solving trust. Inefficiency is much later, and and a lot of times uh, we miss that part because we assume trust is kind of I've launched a product and people should trust, start trusting me. Uh, it doesn't happen. You have to work towards making people trust your product, and and uh, uh, if you can do that, uh, uh, you can make them do many things with your product. That's a unique thing about India, where if your brand is established, you can launch 25 services under the same brand, and it would work. So those those are some of the thoughts that I have uh, for now, and and and. Uh, would love to kind of get into a Q&A mode. Hey, that's awesome, Kunal. Uh, and I think your observations about how the markets are different, uh, people's behavior, and perhaps the set of problems that they're solving is different between multiple geographies is a very good one. Uh, you know, there's recently a, a very good book. Uh, you know, one of the uh, professors from Harvard had talked about reverse innovation and why. A lot of companies are trying to kind of take a product that works in one geography, move it to another, and, and just magically hope it will work. Uh, yeah. But I think it was missing the same element that you brought up, um, where you, you know the ability to do customer inciting, uh, I think, is probably one of the most critical skills, um, whether you're an entrepreneur uh, or a product leader. So that's, that's yeah. very well said. So uh, you know, one of the one of the hottest things, and, and I'm going to open up a bunch of uh, questions that I'm very curious about, and, and I think the, the question list um, seems to be building up here. Uh, those who are interested in asking a question, just going to put that in the chat window so we can um, uh, start firing them away uh, for Kunal. Uh, you, you know, you talked about Delta IV, uh, which is a fascinating theory. Uh, and a framework more than a theory uh, in, a, in a more applied fashion on how one should be building an entrepreneurial idea and I think you go through several examples um, on on what that Delta for is uh, and for those who have not seen this you know I strongly recommend you do a Google search and you'll find a couple videos um, I, I went through one of them at least and was fascinating uh, so a couple questions I had you know around that uh, you know you talk about inefficiency. You talk about uh, taking consumers to a much higher level of efficient, you know, efficiency, so that they can actually be aware, um, you know, of the inefficiencies. Now, can you can you share some thoughts um, on how does one, when you have those ideas that you come across, you know, especially when you are in the early stage of your entrepreneurship, or for that matter, a product manager sitting in a larger company. Um, how do you find the resources or the necessary skills to go, you know, evaluate or execute on that idea? You, you know, if an idea matches what you think is a Delta IV idea, what's your, what, what's your advice um, on how one should go about it uh, in terms of evaluating and executing? Yeah, I think uh, 
the evaluation is a framework that I've talked about in Delta 4 is basically what you do is instead of starting to build the product, you prototype it or even have like screenshots or wireframes and actually discuss with potential customers on what they feel about that. If they feel a strong Delta in terms of efficiency that they feel with the product in future versus in the past, you start building it. A lot of times I've seen the classic mistake of people building first and then trying to go to the market to see if people make sense. And I, I, I disagree with this whole belief of failing fast and uh, winning through that. I don't think that is the smartest strategy around when you can have methods to plan better and, and be successful at the idea. That's one. Uh, uh, two, in terms of how does one go about executing it, I think uh, there, there are no rules. Uh, uh, I, I, I would not recommend that you should have a set of rules that, hey, you do this and that and this. For example, uh, we did not even write the first code till we got all the partnerships in place that I wanted to get in place before I launched the product. We, we started writing code after that. Uh, we did not even have uh, like a full-fledged office before we were doing that or we were just working out of a garage setup somewhere. Uh, we had, I had not even left my job when I started Free Charge. I was still, uh, uh, it, it's just good that my, my partner in the business was actually my boss and I told him that I'm going to keep doing this till it gets to a point when I'm going to leave my job and do this full time. So it, it, one, one, think of, one thinks of startup as like this big risk that one needs to take and jump into something and uh, try it out and risk it out. I don't think you know, you need to really risk it out. I, I don't think that uh, the the whole glory around or the whole thing about courage and other stuff is is is, is relevant. I mean, it's kind of overrated according to me. Very interesting. So, so you're saying, you know, this is not a, a clean transactional cutoff that you are an entrepreneur or, or you're not, right? And one day you just don't wake up, leave everything and kind of say, hey, Scratch your head. How do I, how am I going to do this? You're going to do this in an evolutionary manner, um, yeah. and you perhaps even to. hedge your risk by staying where you are and then you know trying these things out, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, 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 you know a lot of times people tell me that hey, Kunal, we we see so many people uh, uh, who are successful entrepreneurs are dropouts. So this is what I tell them that uh, it's it's quite. A common knowledge to know that all the people with very high IQ don't believe in God. Uh, but I tell them that if you stop believing in God, does not make sh does not ensure that you're going to get a high IQ. High IQ. Uh, <laughs> very interesting. Yeah. So, interesting. so uh, that's the thing that I see that now we we take these we we, we look for these uh, mantras and scripts and methods and processes to become an entrepreneur. Uh, this is apparently not a, a job with a, uh, a, you know, uh, an operating procedure given to you that, hey, this is what you do, this is what, what you're going to see now, you do step number two, step, you know, step number three, there is no such thing. If anybody is telling you that, it's probably just making money out of you. Got it. So, you know, related to that, one of the questions that I'm kind of parallelly looking at the stream um, that's coming in, so I'll try to insert the questions coming from the audience as and when. So one of the, one of the questions I think Nageshwar uh, Rao is asking is that, you know, if you are in that mode of, you know, working wherever it is that you're working, you, you think you have an awesome idea, hopefully it meets the Delta IV framework that you've laid out for people, uh, you start you know, prototyping it, you start showing it around in, in your example, you know, building those business development relationships. Uh, at what point, you know, a lot of people use this word MVP, but, you know, but putting buzzwords and frameworks aside, like you said, at what point do you, do you believe that the product is kind of ready to hit the market? And at what point do you jump off the cliff, if you will, uh, by, by focusing on it full time? Um, I, I Again, I, I don't think there are good answers for that. Uh, in our case, uh, uh, I did not jump onto this full time till we were like doing, I don't know, 10,000 transactions a day. Uh, I was still running my, doing my job. And I, yes, I was working like a madman like 14 hours a day, but that's what it is. Uh, 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 
and and uh, I I I jumped into doing this uh, uh, full time when we got to a very large scale. It means from a startup startup standard, ten thousand transactions a day is something that most startups don't achieve a scale in, in the country. Forget about jumping <laughs> at that juncture. So. Uh, it, it really depends. Uh, uh, one should not. I mean, one should feel that this is it, and this makes all the sense, and uh, uh, and and nobody else should be able to tell that to them. I mean, they know it the best. Got it. So the the feeling inside and and the validation outside should be a good combination for for one to kind of decide. Yeah. Kinda what you Got it. So coming back to coming back to Delta Four, um, one of the other things that you also highlighted, which I thought was also pretty remarkable, is uh, going from USP, which is a very often you know used and, and sometimes even misused terms uh, in India, uh, in a unique selling proposition to a more unique bragging proposition, right? UBP. Yep. Uh, and and you know this this concept has been around uh, for some time in the valley. Maybe they call it differently, but I think you eloquently put it in that you know the product kind of self sells itself, right? You should not yep. be burning, you know, dollars on Google, uh, AdWords, or or wherever. And if the product is really good, if the value proposition is strong, um, you know, there should be a viral phenomenon uh, for people who kind of you know sharing, yep. recommending. So, so that that certainly works uh, in consumer uh, type of scenarios. What what's your take on how do you achieve that for a B two B product where you know your end user might not be quote unquote as much social, as much connected, uh, uh, or there might not be an easily available community to go share and talk about these things, right? So, how does the UBP yeah. principle work for B two B? So there are a few ideas uh, one can talk about. Uh, uh, it is not true that the uh, business community is not social. You'll be surprised the amount of WhatsApp groups people have in sales community. Like I'm part of one group which is area sales managers of FMCG companies. For some reason, for fun reasons, I was added to that group. There are like 4,000 different area sales managers of different FMCG companies having a Facebook group talking about different things, right? Uh, People are connecting with different uh, agendas with their peers from different different companies, right? So you will see salespeople talking to each other. You will see uh, I don't know finance people talking to each other from different companies and so on and so forth. So I, I disagree that they are not as social. I think they are becoming more social than ever. That's one. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, I, I believe the next set of uh, uh, job disruption is not going to happen by creating a new app or new site it's just going to be a social thing where people will always know each other and always recommend each other uh, uh, when a job opportunity shows up in their respective companies that's one uh, second thing is that you can always create these interesting things where you can take videos of existing customers uh, and you know, kind of attach that to some of your pitches that you do uh, but but I still strongly believe that you should always get the like I don't know, if you are a B2B company selling to let's say potentially 500 customers who could potentially use your product, hypothetically. Uh, and so what I would do is uh, sell to the hardest customers first, right? And and let's say if I'm going after a product that sells to pharma companies and there are let's say 100 pharma companies in India, I would sell to the anywhere between number one and number five uh, first versus trying to go for number 35 and number 38 who could be my friend or uh, in my city and so on and so forth right uh, when you sell to number one or number two number three number four number five uh, and and somehow convince them that this is really working for them and like it may take a lot of years sometimes to get it right or uh, uh, months to even convince them to use your product but when you get these hard customers first getting the 100 becomes super, super, super easy. But let's say if I get the number 40 pharma company first, and then now I go and pitch to number two company and number six company that, hey, I've already worked for this number 40 company, they are less likely to even give me a meeting. Forget about uh, using my product. So you can use this in, in very different ways, but I, I again, uh, I mean, if you study the human behavior of aping, you'll understand that we always imitate the people superior to us. 
uh, uh, very rarely you will see people imitating their driver or their maid. They'll always imitate their boss. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, in a lot of research has happened on this, you know, so-called social proof, as you yeah. as you mentioned, and uh, you know, companies like SAP have done fairly well in in, in well, leveraging or exploiting that. Uh, saying that these ten companies run on SAP, that's it. You don't need to do much. Exactly. Exactly. In fact, you know, they're they're the billboard ad. They're still one of the classic, uh, you know, revolutionary things that, that I'm sure everybody on the call has seen and. You know, no matter which part of the country or which part of the continent you are, there's always an ad at the airport in SAP. Citibank runs on SAP, or somebody runs on SAP, right? So, uh, got it. So, so you're you're saying that you know, even though it might, they might not be as viral, things are kind of moving, and and perhaps a B2B product will also find enough uh, chatter, community, and virality. Um, uh, you know, if the product value proposition is very strong, uh, or, or worth bragging about, right? The, the UBP. Yep. Now, you know, speaking of speaking of say, sorry, you were saying something, Kunal? No, no. no. I, 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 go ahead. Yeah. You know, speaking of sales, um, you, you know, there's this uh, going going trend that you know, ten years ago, and for the longest time, um, uh, but certainly you know, up until ten years ago, you know, a, a large percentage of people who were in the CEO, uh, in the president role. Uh, for for companies both small you know and large, uh, they used to come from sales, and in the last ten years, you know we're, we're seeing the trend completely reverse where there's a lot more product folks who are now at the helm, right? I mean even if you look at the more recent announcements at Adobe and Microsoft globally, you, know, you have product people, mm -hmm. you have product managers, you have product uh, product leaders now at the helm. You know obviously you, you know are, are another good example. Um, uh, now, you know, so I, so I have a two-part question uh, to this, right? You know, one, what is the trend that you see uh, of this kind of happening in India? Uh, you know, sales professionals leading this versus product professionals leading it, especially when you mention that it has to self-sell. Um, and, and second, maybe more personal question um, is, you know, as you were growing the company, at some point you hired a CEO. Yeah. Um, and, and Alok Goel, who was the chief product officer, you know, head of product management at Redbus, you know, was your choice um, yep. to help kind of run that. So, you know, what is the trend that you see, and, and do you believe this will be relevant in India, uh, even though it's kind of panning out that way uh, in the U.S. Uh, and the rest of the world? Uh, I think uh, I, I, I usually stay away from generalizations. I, I don't believe that. This is like the trend that is going to become the thing. I think uh, anybody uh, 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 who who can understand how uh, I believe that as the world is becoming more and more connected, uh, the shelf life of every business and every revenue model is kind of shrinking as there is almost no information asymmetry. And because of that, uh, one needs to be constantly looking at how do you evolve the product to kind of meet the ongoing demand uh, from from various places, and if you don't do that, uh, uh, you are at the risk of being disrupted very quickly. But the thing is, uh, a lot of times these things are 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 kind of very clear in the hindsight and not very clear when you are actually running the show. And and to kind of avoid that situation, it's best to kind of constantly challenge your product thinking and push the limits on different things. Uh, uh, I, I guess companies are realizing that that they need to bring people who will do self destruction versus waiting for uh, destruction to happen from the outside. Uh, and 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 it, it is good to kind of try experiments with I don't know both engineers and product leaders uh, to come and do that. Uh, but it, it's it is a, again a risk when you say hey this is the norm and let's just have product guys leading the show everywhere. I don't think that works because every uh, business is different, right? And as a as as a product person, uh, one one should realize that no, it should it's not that we just kind of hey, let's say uh, all e-commerce sites have an add to cart button. Let's just add all add to cart everywhere because that's the norm. Uh, and then you find out that most Indians have never used a cart to shop. Uh, in India, and, and you realize, oh shit! I, I did not understand. Add to cart is something that is alien to most, and checkout is something that most Indians have never experienced. Uh, they use it as they use the word billing counter, 
Uh, same way, what happens is when you kind of make something standard, saying that this is what's the norm, uh, that becomes your trap. So my view is that uh, uh, it should not have um, such beliefs. Our, our product leaders are are getting uh, good challenges. Uh, marketing and product is kind of getting fused into one. Growth and product is becoming fused into one. Uh, I, I think uh, very soon uh, the org structures of many companies will see a massive transformation as well. Very interesting. Uh, so one of the questions uh, that I think is also coming here from the audience, and, 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 and I think I had a similar one as well, but I'll, I'll use the one from the audience. So, you know, they, they're saying, look, you know, they, they heard you talk about why giving up addiction uh, is is a path to generating wealth, and I think the context that you might have used it is was in the context of hey, you know, having a stable monthly salary is also an addiction, um, and you know, at some point you need to kind of be more yeah. entrepreneurial in your mindset, uh, even if you don't jump off the cliff. What what is your advice? Um, and while that is good for entrepreneurs, there are some who might not be ready or might have assessed themselves not to be fit to go start their own right from a not from a product creativity and idea generation or idea management but just from a personal risk taking perspective right now what would be your advice on what is that one addiction or a few things that they should give up uh, especially for those who are kind of entrepreneurs or mid level mid level uh, managers in a company uh, i think the most important thing is to know yourself uh and and uh, if you stay in doubt, you'll always be kind of looking at many things and finding it to be uh, uh, scary and finding it to be exciting at the same time. And you'll always have the grid and the greed and fear working with you all the time. But the thing is, you don't uh, uh, pull the trigger, uh, and you, when you don't get into that, you you you'll not know what to expect, right? But the thing is, uh, as we age and as we take on more of these societal forms of uh, uh, structure, for example, let's say we buy a house, we buy a car, uh, uh, we get married, we, we have kids and, and their EMI starts and all of that stuff, we are less prone to take risk. Uh, I think therefore stable income therefore is the most amazing uh, addiction that has ever been created. I mean, nobody, nobody ever wonders that no business is paid on a fixed basis, but why is everybody who is working for that company work paid on fixed basis, right? We never think about this point. Uh, but it's a very important point to think about, right? What if everybody had to share the same risk as the entrepreneur um, of being not being paid on fixed basis, but having to still pay on fixed basis, right? It's like uh, 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 kind of a weird thought if you think about it, right? Uh, also, I believe that uh, if you if you see yourself, uh, so a lot of times I see people result in leaving the job and being an entrepreneur is that they see the world is being kind of gradually growing their incomes when they see number of years of experience, right? But if you see yourself as a person who's having more experiences per year versus years of experience, uh, 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 it is just harder uh, 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 for people to deny how, how good you are at a certain things, right? So uh, you have to understand that uh, the experiences per year is something that you do it to yourself, right? No boss is going to accelerate the amount of experiences you're going to have per year. Uh, 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 if you are the type which is, uh, uh, let's say if people are having six experiences per year uh, and, and you are, are forcing yourself to get into situations and uh, getting into, let's say, a, a webinar like this and pushing yourself and uh, getting, let's say, uh, uh, 20, 30, 40 experiences per year, uh, you will soon find yourself kind of stifled in the place and, and maybe it may be a good time to try uh, at least working for a startup if not starting up. Because I can tell you one thing that uh, uh, people who work for startup, I have seen many people like the current CEO that I've hired, Govin, he comes from, he was a CMO of Airtel before that. and, and uh, he, he he enjoys that experience of you know the empowerment of being in a startup and uh, uh, taking more risk and and kind of being able to execute uh, without having to go through the pain of uh, approvals and processes that one has to go through. Uh, uh, it's quite liberating uh, uh, and and therefore uh, 
if if not if if the the logical step sometimes may not be to jump directly to do a startup but just probably take up a startup job yeah i think that's very good advice and 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 i was just kind of writing this down so there are two two aspects that i think uh, i have some follow up questions as well and uh, and i think but before that i'm going to take one of the questions here from the from the stream so you mentioned you you obviously you hired Alok Goel before uh, the acquisition happened. Now you've hired somebody else. Uh, now that you've gotten experience where you're kind of finding you know you you, you found the company and then you're finding somebody else to kind of help run the product, run the business. Uh, so two questions are coming up, right? What what is it that you look for when you hire? Um, why don't we start with that and then I'll hold off to the second one. So wh what how does Kunal hire? What if you need to get into a free charge in a senior role working with Kunal, what does that mean? What would you have to show? What would you have to demonstrate? Uh, so I think uh, for me, uh, the ability to have cognitive dissonance is a big thing for me, right? I don't, I mean, I like people with opinions, but I, I like people who can be able to uh, argue from both the sides uh, on any point of view. So that is something that I look for, and I, I think I've made mistakes when I've hired people who cannot think from both the sides. They usually tend to be extremely biased about views. That's one. Two, I would say that uh, uh, they should be the kind of people who, who feel that, uh, uh, hey, there's this project and there are 10 people on it. They should be like technically just one person on it, and I should be able to just finish it off versus having to deal with 10 people and get stuff done. I, I look for people who are these 10x employees who don't necessarily need an army of people around them to get stuff done. That's my second thing. Uh, the third thing I would say is that uh, uh, if they have uh, like deep knowledge about anything, they should not be just like uh, mediocre about everything. They could be just have a deep knowledge on, I don't know, maybe a sport, maybe a a uh, topic, maybe a uh, 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 let's say consumer behavior. They should be having uh, one deep interest in in something that, and and they should be like better than anybody else on that topic. Uh, should be able to handle any questions, topic criticism, anything on that topic really well. So I look for these kind of traits, uh, uh, which kind of makes the hiring process slow. But I think in the tech startups, uh, large employee base actually acts as a uh, the law of negative returns kick in. Uh, forget about law of diminishing returns. Yeah, that's very interesting. In fact, you know, this whole uh, concept of having more experiences kind of packed, you know, into a shorter time, right? So while everybody is learning, you you kind of get into more experiential learning uh, by by developing the speed with which you learn. I think it is was was an important takeaway. Um, on the on the thought of you outlining what you look for um, when you're hiring, the second part of that question was, what are the challenges that you find as you go look at the pool available in India? Uh, and what did you wish you had more of? Uh, even though we seem to have probably one of the largest, you know, um, the largest set of technology talent, uh, in, you know, arguably probably around the world. What is the challenge, if at all there is one, as you hire, as you look at, as you interview uh, and meet folks? I think thanks to our education system, we have very little creativity in our talent force. And, and it is really a sad thing. Uh, 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 like people usually have a maximum of two lenses or three lenses to look at a problem or a situation and not have like 10, 15 lenses to look at the same situation and, and be able to come up with interesting creative solutions. Uh, I, I find that to be the biggest challenge uh, in, in India uh, uh, because of the education system which expected it to be disciplined and score marks but creativity is not about being disciplined and not about scoring marks but just solving things, things most uh, creatively which is probably more efficient sometimes, right? Uh, it is, that's interesting. What what would you say is the delta for for education, the education industry and, and applying your inefficiency model? 
What do you think is the delta for? What would be um, you know, what, would uh, what most people are treating education for is to increase their income and not to learn. We treat education as some insurance policy that we keep investing years into and at the end of it we'll get a money back policy. Very interesting, yeah. <laughs> That's the most bullshit thing that we can do to ourselves uh, by having that mindset and therefore we say Achha, kaun sa stream lena what kind of stream should I, my kid be studying in and, and therefore we pick the insurance policy that appears to be being, giving them highest returns. Yeah, and, uh, and go with the, the safest choice, you know, that perhaps yeah. 20 and, and, years and ago. The choice that will be best for you because you are like, hey, this is, looks like the choice which gives the best kind of outcome. Let's just take this insurance premiums. Um, and, and, and therefore, uh, the, the delta for me, according to me, will be that when there are more examples of people who did not take these parts uh, and still succeed, uh, creating role models, enough role models out there uh, to really say that, hey, uh, it's not about what you scored in the exams or or, or, or or did you have the learning mindset after that, right? So for me, I see a lot of people who are like stopped reading and studying anymore. They are like done. Yeah, it's no longer relevant, right? So. They think they think of like the I remember one quote saying that a lot of people treat education as something that they have to finish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very true. Very true. In fact, you know, I uh, I was looking up and and one of the Google search uh, you know showed this up and I, and I don't know if this is true, so I'm gonna you know put you on the spot and 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 read this out. But you know, apparently you were at some leadership summit in Hyderabad at ISB, and you said, hey, look, you know, doing Doing a doing an MBA and, and and especially doing one of those general MBAs is, is a waste of time and money. Yeah. Uh, and and look like it you're, you know, you're the first question asked to me in a panel at ISB is what do you think about ISB and I told them it's probably the waste of money for everybody and it was kind of awkward. That's a, <laughs> that's a pretty bold thing to say actually at ISB. Um, I, I didn't have to. I, I was not looking for an admission over there, so I was fine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess your actions are following up to what you believe, or what you at least um, you know express, right? Because you, you you mentioned you also dropped out uh, of one of those conventional MBAs that you had you had started early in your career. Um, you know, if there was a you know putting the word MBA aside, if, if there was a a, a forum of you know, a system of learning, uh, right? Uh, assuming that everybody cannot just learn things on their own, um, and or might not have the experiential sandbox, as you mentioned, to be able to develop and gather those experiences. Uh, the so-called new age, it's you not know, learning. True. I I I disagree on the fact that uh, one cannot learn on their own. Uh, we are living in a time where internet can kind of give you information and. Uh, knowledge about things that one cannot even like imagine could exist 10 years ago. Uh, so I completely disagree on the fact that you have to go through the standard uh, method of learning things. Uh, 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 I, I actually have like very little uh, belief that the, the guys who are going to be the, the future smarts are, are going, I mean they probably get inspired by their, by their uh, school or college, but like I doubt they will uh, uh, require that to learn. Uh, I think the kids means imagine the I mean we we are dealing with the gen like imagine the next generation the kids are 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 like already on Google Wikipedia asking questions and learning and questioning their uh, uh, teachers and professors about everything. Uh, you think that generation is going to wait for somebody to tell them what is marketing or what is product or what is uh, a great way of creating consumer insights. No, they will just probably Google watch a two videos. Uh, probably if they get really interested, they'll probably watch eight hours of content and they'll be fairly uh, uh, well positioned to take care of things. Now in that, to add to, I think to your point, uh, you know, the amount of, you know, high quality information available online 
uh, is just exponentially higher in the last five years than maybe 100 years combined, right? I mean, you look at Coursera, yep. you look at edX, um, and there are a lot of online uh, you know, libraries or, or formats or programs available for you not even to uh, put your foot in the campus. Um, yeah. And, and it's already happening. And the funny uh, enough is, you know, the early indications of these online learnings, by the way, uh, and the problem might be somewhere else, right, not the access to knowledge. Uh, but it turns out that it has been a, a pretty big failure. Uh, you know, Coursera recently made an announcement uh, that you know, 90, 94 percent of their their enrolled students they drop off and they don't finish the class. They don't finish the even the online version of it. And yeah. the moment they put a, a certificate uh, or a coach uh, where there's a little bit of a feedback driven model, that ratio went from 94 to to 40. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, very interesting trends are happening uh, in that online Especially world as well. But that's the thing about if you somebody's playing a game also, if you don't give them a leaderboard or a certificate at the end of it, if they've completed a game level, they'll drop out from a game as well. Why talk about education over here? That's how we are designed to operate. Yeah, yeah, yeah good point. So, uh, I mean, imagine a sport which has no results. Would you play that sport? Yeah, <laughs> or no celebration at the end. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so these are these are. Uh, and, and 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 it's oh, means I have done like probably fifty things online and I have dropped off in the middle because it doesn't matter. I found something more interesting to look at while I was yeah. watching that video. So who says that you have to uh, stick to like imagine I uh, means let's say you are uh, hearing this webinar. If you don't like it, you can just walk off. Like nobody stops you. Nobody has a problem. Uh, but if you like it, you'll stick around and and probably go through the end of it, right? But uh, that's the beauty about learning online. Speaking about the webinar and the people, I think we uh, certainly nobody is dropping off after this engaging discussion. I think I see you know, anywhere from uh, 70 to 80 live uh, active audience and the questions are still coming in. So uh, good. So let me, let me kind of <clears throat> take a few questions. And I think a lot of questions that I'm seeing here are around free charge. So maybe we, we spend some time uh, to kind of go more inwardly looking uh, on the company itself. And, and I think that the macro question, you know, uh, that I see here is a big, big thread of about six or seven of them have asked, uh, you know, Tarun has asked, uh, Sri, Sri Hari has asked, Balaji has asked. So, you know, you, you've obviously done a lot, you know, right from, you know, starting a t-shirt business at 16 to PESA back you know, in, in the early 2000, and then free charge, and, and free charge is probably one of the, you know, a role model uh, and, and one of the largest acquisitions uh, in India now. Now part of Snap Deal. So, so what's next for free charge? And if a related question, what's next for Kunal? Free charge is is doing well. We've probably uh, doubled or tripled business uh, after the acquisition, and and uh, continue to grow month over month. Uh, and and uh, it's in a pretty good shape. Uh, uh, a long way to go. We are at probably the very very early stages of India India internet economy. So I think long way to go on that. Uh, on 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 what next for me? I don't know. Uh, uh, and I'm happily undecided at this point of time. At the end of Maslow's hierarchy, there is freedom. You should enjoy it before you start again. <laughs> Very true. So some related questions on um, uh, here. So Raj, Raj is asking about you know your views on fashion commerce, um, and and and, and I, I guess you know different than just e-commerce, but you know something that's kind of more fashion commerce. Uh, there's a related question from Rohit, um, you know, around innovations like you know pay and chat. Uh, there's somebody who's asking Suresh. I think is asking a little bit about. Uh, are you turning free charge into a kind of financial? Is it a fintech company? Uh, and if so, you know, wh where is that going in terms of kind of PayPal? And, and look at and look at some of the, uh, you know, uh, non-banking sector. You know, turning that into wallet. You know, Paytm obviously is doing a lot of that now. Um, so I guess related question around free charge. 
what what do you think about the direction of where it, it will be going? Is it going to grow further and deepen on the area that it already is, or is it going to widen into other segments, other uh, other value propositions? So the answer is simple. Uh, uh, no, as as uh, industry guys, we love to put companies in these compartments. So you are a fintech, so you are a retail, so you are a, a content company, so you are this, so you are that. Let me tell you the future. There will be no departments. You will be consumer companies that people do multiple things with. And and uh, so if I if somebody has to ask, uh, what's Amazon? What is Amazon? Is it a retail? Is it a cloud company? Is it a logistics company? What is it? Or if you ask Google, what is it? Is it a hardware company, a search company, an ad company, or, or an operating system company? If you, you, you will see more and more examples um, where uh, the whole need to put things into these buckets and departments of your mind are going to be very hard to keep up to. So uh, we, we want to be in the business of making uh, any transactions uh, that are painful to become painless. Uh, that's what we think, and anything that falls into that, we'll do it. So we we tell ourselves that uh, a free charge will eliminate the time taken or the pain in doing any transactions that you hate to do. Very interesting. And that kind of that broadens the. So I guess you're right. It, it, it certainly goes beyond what the traditional notion of a segment or an industry, right? You're you're saying or a company, a customer, or a company. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the definitions uh, are done to comfort our mind to understand things. But let me tell you one thing. Uh, you no, know, the the thing that I say often is that you no know, beliefs are very comforting, but they also keep prisoners. You should not be that prisoner. <laughs> That's very true. Very true. And I think as you said earlier, even in the discussion that was going on with the education, you know, part is, you know, in the past, you know, just because it worked for someone somewhere before doesn't mean it will for you, right? And things have changed, models have changed, people have changed, problems have changed. Um, so and I think your original... Really fast. They're changing really fast. Something yeah. that you will not even catch. By the time you get comforted into believing something, it's already irrelevant. It's already late. Yep. So uh, another. So by the way, the second part of the question. So what does that mean for Kunal? So what's Kunal's next thing beyond free charge? No, I, I already answered that. that. I said that I'm I'm happily undecided and will stay that way till I know what's interesting enough to do. Mm. Got it. So I'm just kind of screening through uh, a couple of questions and try to kind of group them. There's a lot of them. Um, some are very specific, so I'm gonna. So, for example, Raj is asking about, you know, the specifics of how many investors did you meet before you found one. Uh, there's. A... Uh, okay, I'll answer that question. We we did not right. meet investors. Uh, uh, I believe that the way you raise money is that investors should find you. Uh, I've rarely seen founders being successful when they chase investors to ever get money. Only when the investors chase you, you get money. It's like imagine a, a an attractive person in the uh, attractive girl in the college or attractive boy in the college. Uh, they don't go around proposing; uh, they get proposals. Uh, if your company is not that attractive, boy or girl in the college, you will keep asking uh, other people, and nobody will say yes. Yeah, good analogy. Uh, so Soumya uh, has a question, and, and her question, I think, like maybe one or two other questions I saw so far, is that you know, so you know, what what was the rationale thinking going into uh, selling the company? Um, you know, and quote unquote, what Soumya is asking, you know, why did Kunal choose to sell? Uh, the objective of any business is to create great outcomes for everybody who's involved in it, for your employees, for your investors, for your consumers, and for yourself. If you see that happening, you should do, take that decision. Uh, and and uh, we often think of companies as our, our 
our spouses that we should not part with, but that's not the right approach. Uh, sometimes you have to treat them as your kid, which is better off going to the next stage on their own or with somebody else uh, at the next game uh, or the next level of game. Uh, a lot of times we kind of put human attributes to our companies and therefore uh, find it weird when somebody sells a company or buys a company. Uh, but these are non-living beings and, and, and we should kind of look at their uh, long-term sustainability and, and dispassionately think about their life without you. Great. So I'm going to go back to your original uh, tenant. In fact, you opened it up with it and there's a couple questions around it on the whole customer insighting uh, you know why is it important? It's it's very clear. I think there's some questions on how. Um, and so Suresh uh, Kumar is asking about you know how much research is enough to know that you are ready. Um, you know Raj uh, Raj Barak is asking about you know are there some unique customer inciting methods um, that are practically being used today in businesses. Um, and, and, and are there some of those that you had used which might be of value to the other fellow uh, product leaders here? Uh, first uh, point in terms of uh, how much of research is enough, uh, uh, the answer is uh, if you are going to give your three, four years to something, uh, don't look for a number from, my, from me to say, oh, Kunal said 500 surveys are enough to do this or 10 customers is enough to do that. It's your decision in your life and you should feel comfortable that this sounds like enough, but be paranoid enough uh, to say, for for example, we, we probably asked 500 people before we jumped into this. Uh, uh, will that, is 500 good enough? I don't know. If 50 good enough? I don't know. Uh, I, I, whatever that number is, uh, uh, it, it's not, it, it, you should feel right. And, and that also answers the second question that when you are going through this thing, don't rely on a survey agency to do that for you. Do it yourself. And the only true method of getting constant insights is to talk to people yourself. Talk to consumers yourself. Understand what they are really trying to say. Don't enforce your biases on top of what you are asking. Uh, just hear them dispassionately without your idea. A lot of times I've seen people fall into a trap of falling in love with their own idea. Uh, the idea that you should be in love with is being successful, not the idea that you came up with. A lot of times uh, people go down the wrong path because they think of their original idea to be great and not see any flaws in it. Uh, there is a huge bias called as confirmation bias that exists in psychology. You should look it up if you don't know about it. Uh, which always puts people in the wrong track because they start believing their original ideas to be true and constantly seek information confirming that versus disagreeing with that. Brilliant. Well, uh, that's about all the time we're going to have today. Uh, and just to be cognizant of your time, Kunal, and, and I think it's kind of getting late <coughs> in India, uh, certainly getting uh, hunger time for me here at lunch. But uh, hey, um, this this is an awesome opportunity. I think people who have questions, please keep on uh, flowing them. I think they probably are best to post here. And and what what uh, I think Padmaja, if you can uh, take those questions um, and, and even send the link to Kunal so he can answer them offline as well on the blog. Uh, that way the conversation doesn't have to end here today um, and and continues forward. Uh, so on the on a parting thought, um, any. Any any final advice? Uh, you know, you obviously you talked everything from customer insighting to to developing multiple experiences uh, in a more experiential model uh, of learning, as opposed to just kind of getting knowledge uh, or, or theory or frameworks. Uh, you also talked a lot about uh, you know how to hire, how to build teams, uh, and, and your own journey. Any any tips you want to leave behind? Um, you know, for the for the avid learner, uh, and not just learning in the context of theory, but also somebody who wants to aspire and, and kind of look at you as a role model and, and want to become the next generation product leader. Uh, uh, any quick things that you would suggest they should start practicing, start doing, start changing things about themselves starting today? 
Uh, I would say uh, keep doing experiments, and experiments don't have to be limited to your own company. Uh, keep doing experiments around you, at your home, with people around you. Uh, keep uh, creating hypotheses and, and testing them. Just have that uh, basic attitude to test and build new hypotheses of your own on several things, and, and keep reading more stuff uh, uh, around on that area and pushing yourself uh, on going deep into a topic. One of the things that I do is that if I pick an interesting theme or topic, I just go like two, three hours, absolutely binge internet uh, on that topic and kind of get uh, satisfied to kind of see enough about it. What I would suggest is that uh, have have a extremely crazy growth mindset. Uh, if, you, if you are not going to have that, uh, you will neither succeed at your work or uh, at 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 your startup. Awesome, hey, excellent. Once again, thanks a lot, uh, Kunal, and I look forward to kind of seeing you in person and hosting you at the campus as well. Uh, I know this time the schedule didn't work out for you, and uh, certainly look forward to that. All right. Uh, over to uh, over to you, Padmaja. Thanks, thanks, Professor Shah. Thanks, Kunal. Um, I think I speak for all the attendees when I say that that was a really a blockbuster of a webinar for us, a master class in learning how to start up on your own or even to uh, do well in life. Um, so thanks so much Kunal. Um, sure. Just a few notes for our attendees before we wrap up here. Uh, the webinar recording itself will be available on uh, IPL's Continual uh, Learning and Access Program. Uh, there's a free sign up on our website. Please head over there and sign up. Um, I also want to leave you all uh, with a note about our upcoming events. Uh, there's a certificate program, a product management professional workshop coming up in a few days on October 17th in Bangalore. Um, we also have a day in the life of a product leader. This is our uh, very popular uh, series of seminars. This time we're focusing on new age companies, uh, new age careers. Uh, we have a galaxy of product leaders coming in. Uh, people like Amrish Kenge from Mintra, uh, Ranjit Radhakrishnan from Baijus, uh, Rajiv Kondal from IBBO. Um, so hope to see a lot of you over there. Um, November 17th is the date of our next webinar, uh, which will be a conversation between Professor Shah and Puneet Soni. Uh, he's another very famous um, startup guru, entrepreneur, ex-Google, Flipkart, and Motorola. So hope to see you all over there as well. Um, that brings us to the end of the webinar tonight. Uh, thank you all. We do hope uh, that this was a very informative and educational experience for you. And we do hope you'll continue attending all our events. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.